So it has been a very slow news week in Doctor Who. The Vanquishers Doctor Who Flux has finished. That's been that's that's come and gone basically, and we don't really have anything until Eve of the Daleks. However, other Doctor Who showrunners are still currently working. We do know that Russ T. Davis is still writing and producing projects at the same time where he goes into pre-production on series 14 of Doctor Who and the 60th anniversary specials in 2023, or special, I shouldn't say, I shouldn't say plural, uh, tw- <laughs> plural uh, for, for 2023. We don't really know what's happening there yet. But Stephen Moffat did a Q&A at the Oxford Union. He's done some Q&As there in the past. He did one a couple of years ago, and he has returned. Now, there's it's like nearly a full hour-long thing. You can watch it on the Oxford Union YouTube channel. I won't play the full thing, of course, because that would just be... Honestly, it would be very easy live stream content for me, and I'm sure you folks would enjoy it as well, just watching me watch Stephen Moffat do this do this Q&A, do this chat. But I, on, I honestly couldn't really morally abide by it, to be honest. But what we'll do is that we'll just play a quick clip that really, really stood out for me personally, and then we'll just talk and comment upon it and just how the fandom discusses showrunners and discusses the people who make their favorite shows so doctor who um i wanted to ask start with what you think about the return of uh, your good friend russell t davis um as, as returning to doctor who and also perhaps what you think it says about where chris chibnall has taken the show I don't know how the two things are related uh, at all. I don't understand, but uh, um, there's only going to be, I say this with trepidation, so many people who can do it at all. I know this is very self-serving, but that's a tough job, and you need to know a lot. And also, you need to be willing to give over your life for several years in ways that are not healthy or useful uh, to the rest of your existence. It was... Seriously, it's like no other job. You just say goodbye to whole aspects of your life. You screw up every holiday, every dinner, every, uh, every outing with your kids. Uh, Doctor Who screws it up for, that num- for however many years you do that mad job. So there's only so many people who are, one, capable of doing it, he said immodestly. That's just horrible, but you know what I mean. Uh, and even narrower band of people uh, people who are willing to do it, willing and cap- uh, capable. There's just not that many. As to, I mean, what I think about... I- so I just want to talk about that first bit, basically. And that... <laughs> okay, if I do this as a segment on YouTube, this is the thumbnail, okay? Screen cap away, everyone. Um, this is going to be... <laughs> okay, we found our new mug designs, everyone. This is Reeling Moffat. Reeling Moffat, okay? I'll give him a slightly more flattering pose. I had no idea. Okay, that one's slightly better. Okay, so, yeah, this talk that Moffat gives during this segment of the Oxford uh, the Oxford Union Q&A is that it reminds me of a interview that Chris Chibnall did a couple of months ago for Doctor Who magazine. I think it was actually when he announced that he was going to be stepping down as showrunner. It was the Doctor Who magazine, the issue after it had been announced, of course, because Doctor Who magazine, they didn't break that story, but Chris Chibnall was able to open up about it properly. But what he talked about was that it was always a plan for him personally to finish his run on Doctor Who in 2022 or at least around this time and the reason that he gave in that interview of a Doctor Who magazine was that Doctor Who is obviously a massively demanding job where you are living in Wales in Cardiff for almost the entire year and it is a very demanding job and of course I don't envy Stephen Moffat for the work that he did before but I do think in hindsight him doing Sherlock and doing Doctor Who at the same time can't have been good for him and he also opens up up in this Oxford Union Q&A talking about the difficulties of show running two massive massive projects Sherlock was like a big huge blockbuster show you were making three or four feature films every single like every two years it's it was very very difficult for for him and Mark Gatiss as well and for that entire team while he was also doing Doc 2 at the same time probably not good for either show uh, or for Moffat and Gatiss in general but it was what it was but for um uh but for Chris Chibnall, in Doctor Who magazine, he was saying that he wanted to finish in 2022 because he's got two kids who are starting their GCSEs next year, and he wanted to be home, he wanted to be present, he wanted to be around for when his kids are doing their GCSEs. And I think that 
when you put it into perspective like that, when you get so much discourse from fandom about, no, he didn't leave, he was pushed, or uh, Chris Chimler decided to ruin the show and then leave, uh, or leave a job half done, or whatever people are basically saying at this point, we kind of do forget. And I think if, if, this is basically what I was talking about in the uh in the like ball struck and nerdrotic video when the in order to get away with the rhetoric that they get away with they have to justify making the subjects of that rhetoric the targets of that rhetoric be as reprehensible and villainous as possible so you create these personas around the showrunner you create these personas that aren't really substantiated by anything but you if you're able to create those personas it makes it significantly easier to vilify them the way that you do if you were to just say that chris chibnall is just hiring way too many people of color then obviously you'd probably get laughed out of the room depending on what part of youtube you're in However, if you want to make it a bit more palatable, you say, no, he's actually taking jobs away from hardworking whites and he's just uh, diversity hiring, he's just quota ticking, he's just box ticking and stuff. I got a very, very interesting comment on a video, uh, on, on, my, on my Russell T. Davis video the other day. By the, uh, I, I put it on Twitter and the commenter said, so what you're saying is that we, the viewers of Doctor Who, will have to endure more, more crap stories with the same thing in them that has been in them for the past five years that few, if any, viewers liked at all. I responded with lol what because what I like doing is that when someone kind of makes a statement like this I kind of just say I give them a response but nothing substantial to make them kind of dig a little deeper because they obviously want to get they want a response for the attention but they also want to be validated so you just go lol what or something, and then they dig deeper. And this guy dug deep very, very quickly, responding, let me ask you, will the BBC have any input on the story's content or makeup of the ethnicities of the actors in said stories? So this guy went from, uh, <laughs> went from zero to racist very, very quickly. But yeah, that's the sort of like palatable, that's the, that's the palatable uh, content for many people where you need to sort of have this whole conspiracy where you have to have this whole uh, ecosystem that's working against you, shall we say. So when you kind of remember that, no, Chris Jimmel probably isn't leaving because of creative differences. He's leaving because Doctor Who is a massively demanding job. It's difficult for anyone to do it for five years. In terms, he's done less episodes and less seasons because of the gap in the um, productions. But he's been showrunner for a comparable amount of time to Russell T. Davis. But yeah, it's a massively overwhelming and very difficult job, especially putting together a series during a, a global pandemic. Of course, there are some creative decisions that I don't really agree with, but uh, you've got to remember that these people are people. He didn't leave because of that. He left because this was the plan all along. Him and Jodie apparently had this pact, which is something that I obviously can't thoroughly vet or anything, but it's something that I've heard before that Jodie and Chris Chibnall had a like pact where if one of them left... Whoever goes first, the other one immediately follows. That kind of backs up stuff that I've been hearing since 2018. He wants to leave the show because it's massively demanding, but also because he's got kids who he wants to be there for at a very important part of their lives. And of course, Doctor Who is a very, very overwhelming show to be a part of. So anyway, let's go back to Stephen Moffat because now he's actually going to give us the juicy bits talking about Russell T. Davis. Russell was going to do that. He told me the night before. He sent me an email, uh, and I read it. I was just coming home from a restaurant, and I thought, is that real? I'll see if that email's still there in the morning and see if that's real. Uh, and then I, then I phoned him up, and uh, I, said, I said, have you read the writer's tale? Have you read it? Because <laughs> uh, I think you should. And he said, oh, no, I want to do it again. I'm, I just, I'm, I'm, I'm excited, I'm thrilled. And he told me his plans, and... So fantastic ever. I mean, uh, he's the best, he, he's the, uh, the single best writer in, in television drama and he wants to do Doctor Who again. Great news for Doctor Who. Uh, I don't know what, uh, how, how I tie that into Chris, uh, but you know, he's, Chris has done an amazing job uh, and given us a whole new, different, expanded version of Doctor Who, so. Yeah, by the way, this moderator's question, no disrespect to the moderator, but it really came across like he was trying to get a clip, he was trying to get a quote, saying, what do you think of uh, Rusty Davis coming back, and what do you think it says about what Chris Chibnall's done with the show? I honestly believe that is, firstly, a very unbecoming question to ask of the writer, and for the rest of the whole panel and the Q&A, the, the, the questionnaire, the, the 
the the host the question asker the moderator for whatever term you want to use asked very very good questions and everything and it was a really good chat but that particular one that felt that's bait that's bait everyone so yeah but yeah you don't ask moff at that and also like it probably has very little to do with anything there have, i think um there was something that um oh yeah i think he says it in this clip actually talking about oh chris chibble said it was very very hard for him to find a successor uh, uh i i think it's i think chris has said to me in the past not easy to to find a successor not not easy a lot of people that you might think well you you could do that don't want to endure the uh uh, the, 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 the years of slavery uh, uh, that it entails. But uh, fantastic that Russell's going to do it again. Fantastic. Uh, Russell Churchill says Stephen being a class act there absolutely and Kate Castor Review says that that's professionalism uh, say what you will about Moffat yeah that, that's absolutely true it's kind of like when I did my interview with Joseph Lidster for the 1963 live stream where he was saying that um uh, for the 1963 live stream, we had uh, somebody asking, like, what is their least favourite Doctor Who stories? And this is somebody who has, like, written for Torchwood, written for Sarah Jane Adventures, has done so much expanded media and stuff like that, and has, a, has an active relationship with many, like, Doctor Who writers. And someone in the chat was asking me to ask them what was their least favourite stuff. And honestly, I did not want to put that, that writer in that position, because it would be basically slagging off your slacking off your classmates slacking off your workmates and you don't want to be doing that on on a platform where it's meant to be like a good faith uh more generally positive discussion um i also think there's something that moffat said in this uh not in this clip but during the q a generally he says that he doesn't really talk about stuff publicly that he that they didn't that he didn't like about his run anymore because whenever he did he'd get tearful emails from people saying well you're saying that my my one contribution to doctor who is uh is not very good and and yeah and obviously you don't, you don't want to be putting anyone in, in that position you don't want to put anyone in that position it's not it's not it's not becoming of anybody it also doesn't really generally help anybody it was why i said no actually we're gonna ask uh, joseph what what were his favorite stories and i think he chose aliens of london which was very very interesting very very interesting tom blacklow says don't throw your colleagues under the bus is, is just good practice yeah even if you were to like give the most analytical good faith um, and open-minded and understanding critique of your entire life even if it's completely constructive you have to wonder what's the point of it really like apart from the blood sports shall we say it's why when you get people who were talking about when Ross T Davis came back they were like oh why is he saying such good things about Chris Chibnall why is he saying he's, he's spineless he's been forced to say this and no you, these people you can't really you don't really know if they're mates or anything or if they're in regular contact but as Moffat said in this clip Russell T. Davis emailed him the night before, the night before the news broke. Like They have a direct line of communication with each other, and it wouldn't surprise me if they actually read each other's stuff and helped each other out and gave feedback. Like I've got no source for that, of course, but it wouldn't surprise me if these conversations like just happened casually. I, it, it would completely make sense to me. These people, they are people. They are not just... Uh, they're not just um, avatars for gossip and avatars for blood sports, which I think many people, when looking at, uh, at fandoms, when looking at the people who show run and manage the shows that we love, tend to tend to miss the forest through the trees. Will Thomas one nine nine in the chat asks, "Would you like to be a showrunner for Doctor Who?" Personally, personally, I absolutely would love to, but I. I don't really have any professional writing credits, so I'm absolutely unqualified for the job. I, obviously, if I was asked, I would give it a go. I'd give it a go, of course, but uh, maybe ask me after if, if and when I ever get uh, any sort of proper professional projects off the ground. Tom Blacklock says there's an element of sadism of some online criticism, I feel. Yeah, absolutely. I think you can tend, if you like, punch down if you feel the need to and be harsh with your criticisms, absolutely, if you, if you want to and if you feel it's justified. But I feel like trying to rope in the actual creatives into that and if they don't give you what you think you're entitled to, like label them as a coward or for having having ulterior motives i think that kind of says a lot more about the person making those accusations than it does about the writers harvey smith says it's not likely but i'd love an rtd moffat series partnership one day chibnall's my fave all the way but i just like the muffin i feel like a muffin rtd are a power duo yeah they're a massive power couple as well massive power couple big couple energy the two dads uh which we will call them the two dads um yeah I, it wouldn't surprise me if there were 
talks of, oh, I, I got that issue of Doctor Who magazine where it's Stephen Moffat and Rusty Davids interviewing each other. I bought that magazine. I never read it. I've not read it, and that's so bad of me because I really wanted to. I really wanted to read it. Um, yeah. <laughs> WG Fat says this is why making a justified review is hard these days. No, I think reviews are just a part of the fandom. And I also think because Moffat says in this um in this QA saying that basically all Doctor Who fans, like when they say they hate an aspect of Doctor Who, they're lying. And while I don't a hundred percent agree with like the use of the word lying, I I one hundred percent understand the sentiment of it. Where, for example, I do not like, let's say, Asylum of the Daleks which is a Stephen Moffat script. However, I love Doctor Who, obviously, and I only talk about it the way I do because of my love for it. And I think when I started like 10 years ago, I might have been way harsher and way more unbecoming with my language and the way I argued stuff. But I think the way I do it now is way more balanced, I think. And if I do get annoyed, like I think I get a little bit annoyed in my Survivors of the Flux review, it's less this writer's a bad person or a bad writer or whatever, and more... Why did you focus on this element when this element, which you're so clearly good at, was like sat there waiting to be utilized or built upon? White Diet Wolf two one seven says, "Find that magazine for next week's stream." Uh, I'll try. I'll, I'll see see if I can uh, see if I can track it down. Uh, Forty Tyler says, "I read it. Was it show when I showed on? It might have been. Yeah, but it was. It was." Loads of fans were talking about it on Twitter. I thought it was really fun. Tom Blacklock says, some people build a brand on being negative and feel the need to maintain it. Yeah, I was actually chatting uh, about this earlier today. I chatted about this with someone today about um, how I think some people, there were some like YouTubers in the, um, I, who I used to be subscribed to a few years ago who sort of like built their brand on negativity. And now I don't really watch them anymore. And I just kind of got bored by it because it felt like, they felt the need to be negative, and even in their positive elements, it felt like they couldn't really be pleased by anything. And it's like, I don't, I don't think this is constructive, and I also don't really think it's genuine. When you're so like negative as a brand, like, of, like, sorry to keep bringing it up, but you go on like someone like Nerdrotic's channel, but it's like it's all negativity, or like the vast, vast majority of it is negativity and it's like yeah that's obviously where the audience is the audience are being catered to for negativity they're basically being angered for profit but it's there's like no there's i don't think there's anything good with that mentality with that mental state it's not it's not that good uh wally swammer says you are violent back in the days uh, these days you're more savage in your verbal takedowns uh, <laughs> Um, violence because I'm as a, an internet persona inspired by Nostalgia Critic and AVGN. Uh, I think I'm maybe a, uh, more choice with my words. Zach Morris says, what is Chipmunk actually good at? Genuine question. I think he's very good at the frenetic pace and the back and forth kinetic energy of his stories. I think that's what that's the storytelling that he enjoys doing. I think that his his characters tend to get really lost and muddled because of that back and forth, but I think that Chris Chimnall is a writer who loves storytelling. Like telling the story, the back and forth, the whiplash, the frenetic pacing of hopping from world to world, set piece to set piece. I think that the um yeah, I think that the characters, with the best of intentions, he may tend to lose them in that, in that pace. But it's a case of, like, I think that I can almost, like, see and hear the smile on Chipnall's face when he writes a scene transition. And I, I, I like that enthusiasm. I, I think that there's a lot of that, uh, of that energy. Worm C17, Doctor Magazine 551, thank you so much. Uh, Zach Morris says the frenetic pace of some of these posts from RTD. Nah, I think even like back and forth RTD was a lot more, and Moffat as well, maybe to a slightly lesser extent. I think Moffat would have that frenetic pace as the opener of a story and then settle on his locations. Um, I think Rusty Davis would kind of stay in one location for the most part. Like, obviously you'll be able to counter some examples, but for example, The Parting of the Ways, the majority of that story takes place in the same corridors on the space station. The Most of that story, The Parting of the Ways, takes place on floor 500. Midnight takes place entirely on a bus. Like I, I don't see Chris Jimmel writing a story like Midnight, but it's interesting... Eve of the Daleks, which might take place entirely in Elf storage in Elf storage facility, like even something that is is like maybe narratively more basic, structurally more basic, like Resolution, the twenty nineteen New Year's Day special, 
or 20, yeah, 2019 New Year's Day special, the first Dalek one. That still has a lot of locations. That goes from car chase. That goes from uh, an action set piece on the field. That goes to the farm in Sheffield. That goes to the weapon storage facility. Even when it's a bit more structurally, uh, a bit more structurally uh, basic, there's still a real pace to it. There's still a real pace to it. Whereas I think at World War Three, the majority of that story takes place in Downing Street. I think Rusty Davis is really good at just honing in on a location for an episode or two, and that's where, and and that's where he does his business. Uh, Sideman Alf Chipnor Impact Font. Yeah, he loves the um, he loves having titles and words at the top of the page I, I think what's more interesting and maybe a bit more constructive is trying to find out what makes a writer tick creatively uh, i think that stephen moffat what motivated stephen moffat a lot was he wanted a lot of people to understand how smart he was but also that he, he had a real love and enthusiasm and joy for the show and also this idea this metatextual element darren mooney talked about this on the live stream a couple of months ago about doctor who as a tv show even in its own universe where the doctor would appear on tv screens where he would communicate with companions and support and cast the through the tv screens like in word enough in time bill at the bottom of the cyber spaceship is watching a tv screen a black and white tv screen of peter capaldi's doctor in science in the library cal is watching the 10th doctor on a tv screen things like that this metatextual element about doctor who as a show even in the t the subtext of its own show in the metatext that's like the whole the 11th doctor's whole story arc basically isn't it this idea of him being so present in the culture of the universe that these forces are conspiring to take him down that's i think what motivated moffat as a writer and rusty davis is somebody with a massive heart and a massive brain massive heart massive brain where he wants people to be very very optimistic but he's also incredibly pessimistic about the state of humankind so he's got really high highs and really low lows emotionally and he also wants to put his characters through the ringer he's not so much someone who is as interested in the meta text of what he's creating he more wants to characterize he wants to depict characters that he resonates with and then put them through the ringer he wants to test his characters. He wants to test them, and he wants to test um, the world that they inhabit. I think it's why so many of his show, his, his series finales, are these massive threats that need to be dealt with. Like, what does humankind do under these pressures? And nine times out of ten, they bulk under that pressure. Whereas I think Chris Chibnall is very is a writer who's very much more interested in the pace of a story. But anyway, uh, we've still got like another minute of this clip left. So let's keep it playing. Fantastic. He's an amazing writer, so, uh, and he's got a, he's, he sounds, when I spoke to him, uh, really energised and up for it. So my only regret is we don't get more shows like It's a Sin and so on, because, you know, I, I, I love it when he just does some, you sort of, uh, uh, some sort of one-off where he makes a big statement about something, um, you know, uh, which we won't get for a few years, because the big statements in Doctor Who tend to be my army awakes doctor which isn't the same thing really is it I'm, I'm really curious to see what Russell's second go round is like what he does now because you know, being the restless man he is it won't be the same as the first time don't think you know what you're going to get you don't uh, and, I mean I, and I knew a little bit because we chatted but uh, he, he's, uh, he wouldn't be doing this unless he could scare the living shit out of you. So uh, <laughs> it will be great. It will be great. So yeah, it's a really good interview. I, I encourage you to watch the whole like, hour-long thing. It's on the Oxford Union YouTube channel. So yeah, check, check it all out. Uh, Full Moon at 9am says, can't wait for Moffat 2. He does mention in this, he does mention in this interview that he has currently no plans to return to Doctor Who because for him, it only felt like he left yesterday, which yeah, Rusty Davis has got like, he is 12 to 13 years removed from his tenure, whereas Moffat is only like four or five years removed from his tenure. But it's really cool that Rusty Davis has at least given Steve Moffat a couple of teasers or a couple of... Uh, uh, inklings as to what his plan for the show is and of course Stephen Moffat being the consummate professional he is uh, at least creatively in this capacity he 
is not telling. But yeah, that's really cool. Uh, and it's a really good interview as well. Dubin G fan says Moffat does well in interviews. Yeah, and like panels at San Diego and stuff like that. He really excels like in that environment. Some people have been saying that the crowd was dead a little bit. Like they're still laughing. They were still chortling every so often. Uh, so yeah, go check that out. Uh, that interview for the for the Oxford Union. But I think it's it it's something. Honestly, I think Chris Chibnall obviously is not obligated to i think he could maybe stand to do more of i think one reason people have been it's been so easy for some people to vilify him uh for their stupid childish culture war narratives is about like the fact that he doesn't really put himself forward to offer like an alternative narrative really i said this in my review of survivors of the flux i don't really think he's had much of an opportunity to justify his creative decisions uh yeah it's 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 a bit disappointing, but of course, he's not entitled to, to do that. There was another question, I guess, remember, that the moderator asked, the, the the host asked. I keep saying moderator, it's not, it wasn't a debate, what we heard about. There was another question that the host asked of that, of that Q&A, basically talking about, do you think that Little Britain should be cancelled and stuff? And Moffat's like, what are you trying to drag me into this culture war stuff for? Like, I don't, I don't have the answer. Like, why are you asking me this? And yeah, that's, that's bait. That's bait. Russell Jetson says the Flux breakdown video is the most I've heard Chibbles talk about his uh, his uh, Doctor Who. Yeah, and then that breakdown video was really interesting because uh, I saw some people say, like, why, why is he saying I think uh, and... I, like i think think feel feel why, why is he saying that in, in this explainer video and i started watching it and he was like yeah i feel like that uh this story should really challenge the doctor emotionally and i was like dude like what, what are you on about like yeah like why are people having to go at you for saying you feel that this is your mission statement for doctor who and then he mentioned something like yeah i think that azure might have been in like a witness protection thing uh to hiding away from swarm and it's like dude you came up with the character do you not know for sure? Like, yeah, that bit is a bit questionable. If you were to say, yes, this is where the character came from, this is uh, their origin for them, this is why they were there, cool, great. But when you say, I, I think that's what they were doing, what, what on earth? Forty Tyler says, when he explained his characterization of Tech 2, and it literally sounded like the Rani. Uh, as someone who's not the biggest, like, Ra Rani stan, and who knew, we'll get to that in a moment. Yes, thank you so much for the, for the reminder. Yeah, I really liked the interpretation that Chibnall gave in his interview talking about Tech Taeyun, someone who has like the, the the complete disregard for the whole like efficacy of science and views like experimentation as a means to an end in and of itself and how she you know she treated like the doctor like an experiment treated Gallifrey like an experiment the division like an experiment and now without any sort of responsibility to the experiments that she does and commits herself to, decides to just move along to the next universe. And I wish that was in the text itself, because it shows that Chibnall is thinking about the characters. It shows that he is contextualizing them, at least for him when he's putting them on the page. I just think that there's an issue in getting it off the page and onto the screens. That's, I think that's an issue. Sadman Alf says, I would have loved a Chibnall companion video for each episode. That would have been interesting. Maybe every two episodes. I don't think you'd need to do a, a, a weekly explainer, but maybe every two episodes would have been really good. Forty Tyler says, that is the Rani, though. Yeah, yeah, I don't disagree. I don't disagree, but I think there's maybe a bit more value to uh, having your own original creations, even if they do have trappings of older ones, just so that the audience don't go, oh, another thing I've got to research. Yeah, yeah, I think that... To an extent, it can be alienating. I don't really have a conclusion to the showrunner discussion, really. I just think that it's something present in a lot of fandoms as well, where I think when you've got companies like Disney who, who like to really, really control the messaging, really control the narrative, I think that when you've got... Um, a company that really fr tries to sanitize the creative process as well. It might be a bit of a distance between the fans or the viewer and the actual work and the creatives itself, which might help, which might be another issue entirely as well. But I think fandom kind of forgets that the people who make the show are people as well. And I think that they need to do less vilifying, even if it is done in ways that they feel is completely justified. I don't really have a proper cap to this, to be honest, but yeah, I think say what you will about Chris Chibnall, but I think the man works very, very hard. And I also think that he went into Doctor Who and Doctor Who flux with the best of intentions. Uh, and I think as long as your criticism is uh, well-meaning and measured, even if it is negative, I think the intent and the delivery of it, and sometimes I can maybe stand to learn this myself as well, 
But yeah, that's that's all I've got to say, really. Ben Pitcher says he does work hard and so does the whole team. Yeah, absolutely. The whole team works really hard. Folks, real quick, uh, who knew podcast who's in the chats? They, they were dropping this announcement. I was going to message them before I went on stream because I knew they were dropping announcements at 7, 8, and 9. And I was like, J- um, Josh, when's when's my announcement? But yeah, they're doing a Christmas who knew festive extravaganza and they've announced the guests. You've got myself and I'll be joining Harry Draper and Jack Reeves. Uh, Harry Draper, writer, he's been on, he's a friend of the live stream. We've had him on before talking about his uh, big finish because he was the, a prior winner of the Paul Sprague Memorial Competition. So when that competition was publicly available, I thought, let's chat with them about it. And it was a great chat. Um, Harry's a terrific writer as well. Uh, Jack Reeves as well from the Community Show, another friend of the live stream. Uh, So he's going to be joining as well. And I'm going to be there. So it's going to be us three and Josh. So uh, check that out, of course, whenever that drops. I don't know if there's a date for it, but we're going to be recording that later this week. And I greatly look forward to it. 